namo vishnu padaya krishna prasthaya bhutale shimate bhakti vedanta swami mukti namane namo vishnu padaya krishna prasthaya Sarasvati Devi Gauravani Prachane Devi Nivase Shasanyavadi Pasyatya
Vishnu Pidaya, Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale, Shemati Bhaktivedanta Samadhita Namaha, Namaste Sarasate Devi Gauravani, Pracharani Nirvishesha Shanyavari, Prasthachade Sitarande. I'm okay. I have been giving a topic to speak on today. Looking it up, excuse me. Um, Attractive Attractive pastimes of Krishna. Uh Okay. Uh, Okay. (coughs) Om Ajnana Timirandasya Vinanjana Salakaya Chaksha Unminitam Dena Tazmai Shri Gurave Namaha Mukam Koroti Vachalam Pangum Langayate Gurim Yat Kripa Tamaham Vande Shri Gurundina Taranam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swamin Iti Namane Namaste Sadaswati Deve Gauravani Pichadene Nirvishesha Shanyavari Pastya Chade Satarane Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasudhi Gaura Bhakti Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So on. Thank you all for coming today and giving me this opportunity uh, to speak with you about the attractive pastimes of Krishna. Interesting topic, interesting, uh, hopefully enlivening, uh, and hopefully relevant. I was going to read a verse um, from a book I've been reading from extensively recently. It's called Brihad Bhagavatamrita. And uh, what made me think about reading from this, a verse from this book is, uh, it was a book that was composed by um, Sanatan Goswami, who is one of the followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And uh, to explain all the details of the book was much beyond anything I could possibly go on in a short presentation here to all of you today. So I'm going to just try to give a little synopsis to introduce the verse that I'll be reading. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes? Okay. I'm used to speaking with a translator and usually the translator needs to be louder than I am. So, (laughs) nobody. So, (laughs) Uh, the essence of this uh, book that was composed by Sanatana Goswami is it was basically presented as a summary of Srimad Bhagavatam <clears throat> and uh, Srimad Bhagavatam ultimately culminates in Tenth Canto which are the pastimes of Lord Krishna uh, it's described at the all the cantos of the Bhagavatam, beginning from the first to the tenth canto, are like looking at the feet of the Lord and then moving up the transcendental body of the Lord and rising to the smiling face of the Lord. And the smiling face of the Lord is his eternal pastimes, which are eternally manifest in the transcendental realm of Goloka Vrindavan. 
And uh, there are speakers, Shukadeva Swami presented Bhagavatam in a, in a way it was very systematic and, and enlightening for Parikshit Maharaj, who had only had seven days and seven nights to live. And therefore, uh, his question to his spiritual master, Shukadeva Goswami, is please tell me what is the duty of a man who's about to die, because he knew he only had seven days and seven nights to live. And uh, so Shukadeva Goswami spoke continuously the message of Srimad Bhagavatam. And then, <clears throat> and uh, Pirikshit Marj chose to neither eat nor sleep, but to hear the message of Bhagavatam, uh, perfected his life by hearing the transcendental narration of Bhagavatam. <clears throat> um, Pariksha Maharaj was the son of Uttara. And Uttara came to Pariksha Maharaj uh, at the, just at the end of hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam. And she was very interested. She wanted to hear him explain, tell me what you've heard. But Pariksha Maharaj didn't have a long time to explain it all, although certainly he understood, heard everything, realized everything, and could have presented the whole Bhagavatam from memory. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, he only had a short time to speak because he knew in due course of time, my fate will, accepted fate, uh, will appear. So, uh, Brihad Bhagavatam Rita is what Parikshit Maharaj told his mother, Uttara, which is a condensed version of Bhagavatam, but it's not that it's taking the Bhagavatam and condensed it to all the messages of the Bhagavatam, but it really, what it focuses on is what is the ultimate goal. <clears throat> and there are two parts of Brihad Bhagavatam Rita. The first part of Brihad Bhagavatam Rita is describes the Narada Muni's journey, who is looking for the person who is the greatest recipient of Krishna's mercy. And uh, Narada Muni uh, visits many exalted Vaishnavas, who are all examples of themselves, who are recipients of Krishna's mercy. But he found, he discovered in his journey from one Vaishnava to the next, that every Vaishnava always considered himself to be unqualified. Every Vaishnava always considered himself to have no love for God. And every Vaishnava considered himself that he doesn't do enough service for Krishna. And every Vaishnava, which is the nature of a Vaishnava, always sees it as somebody who's much better than he is. <laughs> he never thinks he's the greatest recipient of Krishna's mercy. That's the nature of a Vaishnava. A Vaishnava is humble, has so many qualities, never becomes proud. We can describe the qualities of a Vaishnava, but that's not the topic of our class today. <clears throat> but <clears throat> in Narada Muni's quest to find the person who is the greatest recipient of Krishna's mercy, he finally discovered that the greatest recipients of Krishna's mercy were the residents of Vrindavan. Why were they the greatest recipients of Krishna's mercy? Because they were able to capture Krishna's attention beyond anybody else. <laughs> Krishna's love, his affection for them was unsurpassed. Although everybody else had Krishna's attention. Everybody else was satisfied, fully satisfied, because of their love and their relationship that they had with Krishna. And Krishna reciprocated with them according to their love. Nonetheless, Narada Muni, in his quest, he discovered, boy, Krishna is really, really controlled by the love of these residents of Raj. <laughs> and he saw for himself, even when he was in Dwarka, he saw for himself how Krishna was in Dwarka with all the queens, and many, Balaram was there, many other residents of Dwarka were present. But Krishna, 
simply by thinking about the residence of Vrindavan, he began crying and lost his consciousness. And they had to think of a way how to revive him. So one way to revive him is to create a, a, a circumstance by which they brought him to a place called Nava Vrindavan, which is a place where they had, were imitation forms of Nanda, uh, Nanda Maharaj and Jasoda and the cowherd boys, the cows and the gopis and Srimati Radharani and Krishna. Narada was watching all this and even the queens, some of them were present watching all this and they realized Krishna is most attracted, most bound to these devotees. <clears throat> So this is, of course, one of the answers that Uttara wanted to know. Uttara wanted to know that I see that everybody gets a, a, their own special place according to their mood that they have towards the Lord. But what about the place? Where is there, is there a place that doesn't fit into the hierarchy, which is just beyond all of that, where people actually uh, are where the devotees actually have that special relationship with Krishna. What is that special relationship with Krishna that's manifest, which is most attractive, because we're going to talk about Krishna's attractive features. And that special attractive love, kind of love, is called kevala. It's pure love, unmotivated love. Uh, love which uh, uh, surpasses all other forms of love because it's love which brings Krishna fully under control. So much under control that Krishna becomes subordinate to that love. In Vaikuntha, we see Krishna and in Dvarka and in Ayodhya, we see the Supreme Lord manifesting a relationship with his devotees, but there's always a certain element of Aishvaya, or a regal nature. He's always the king, or in Vaikuntha, he's Vaikuntha Nath, uh, or he's Narayan in Vaikuntha. He has four arms, he has, and, uh, and he manifests unlimited opulences. And all the residents of Vaikuntha, and this is described in the second part of Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. <coughs> The second part of Briha Bhagavatamrita is a story of called Gopakumara, who describes all the various different levels which Vaishnavas, persons who are situated in love for God, according to their particular relationship with God, where they uh, can attain their perfected state of, of love. Some perfected beings in this world worship a particular form which they're most attracted to and by perfecting that worship at the end of this life they are taken and they go to that abode in the Vaikuntha, the spiritual world. <clears throat> and there's a whole story about Gopakumar's journey as he traveled from, from this earthly planet and he goes to Svargaloka then he goes to to all the other lokas, Mahaloka, Tapaloka, Janaloka, uh, Satyaloka. Then he goes beyond Satyaloka into the realm, which is they call the uh, uh, Mahakalapur, where the impersonal Brahma Jyoti is manifest. And beyond Mahakalapur, there is there is Maheshtam, and then behind Maheshtam, there is uh, there is uh, Vaikuntha. And beyond Vaikuntha, there's a Yoja. And beyond the Yoja, there is Dwarka. And all of this is within the realm of the expanse of the spiritual planets, which are all eternal. They are all eternally manifest. And they're all of these abodes, they have forms of the Lord who descend. They're called avatars. Just as Ram descends, the Shingadev descends, they descend from these spiritual realms. But beyond all of these realms, there's a special place where there's no conception 
of the Lord's divinity. <laughs> Everything else is Aishvaya. He's the great worship. He's the center. He's, he's the, the predominating deity of every Vaikuntha planet. Everybody worships him with reverence, because uh, that's part of Aishvaya's is a worship of reverence. But beyond that, there's a special place where these special devotees can go and the most attractive pastimes of the Lord are manifested. And why are they so attractive? Because they're described as madhurya. Madhurya means they're sweet. There's something sweet about them. What's sweet? What's sweet about them is that Krishna, although he's the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Bhagavan, who's all attractive. Yes, he's the most beautiful. He's the most renounced. He's the most intelligent. He's the most wise. He's the most famous. Uh, what did I miss? The sixth sign. Wealthy. Most wealthy, of course. <laughs> I <show you>. Most <laughs> wealthy. <laughs> most. He's manifesting all of these qualities, which, of course, as sometimes we say that somebody is attractive because they may have one of these qualities. A wealthy person may be attractive because of his great wealth. Uh, a beautiful person may be attractive because of their beauty. Uh, uh, an intelligent person may be attractive because of their knowledge. But Krishna possesses all of these in full, so they say, we say he's most attractive. He's the most wealthy, he's the most intelligent, he's the uh, most famous, and uh, so he's all attractive. So we may say, well, let's stop there. Krishna's all attractive because he's, but this, he manifests all of these qualities in full, but there's actually something that's even more attractive about his personality, is that's his sweetness. The sweetness is that although he's the Supreme Lord, although he's the Supreme Lord, he becomes completely subordinate to the love of those devotees who love him in a very personal relationship as a son, as a friend, as a lover. Krishna becomes subordinate to that love. In fact, and therefore, what makes his, these pastimes so attractive and so sweet is that although he's the supreme lord of, of everything, he becomes so subordinate to the devotee who loves him in these particular moods that his pastimes become very human-like. Human-like. And, but he's God, but they're very human-like and sweet. Why? Sometimes we see this like in Dhammadar Lila, what's so sweet? He cries. He cries like a baby. Sometimes, and Queen Kunti, in her prayers, Queen Kunti, she has this Aishvaya. Queen Kunti, she knows that Krishna is God. So she says about Krishna's pastime that she says, it's very bewildering when you manifest this pastime of crying. What's bewildering to her? Now, someone may say that because Krishna knows that's God, Krishna is, excuse me, Kunti knows that Krishna is God, then she wouldn't be bewildered if she sees Krishna crying because she's just thinking that Krishna is just pretending to cry. He's not really afraid. <laughs> God can pretend to, to cry as if he's afraid. But because Kunti knows Krishna is God, she wouldn't be bewildered by that. It all makes sense. But why is she bewildered? She's bewildered because Krishna's afraid. <laughs> and Krishna's crying. He's so much bound by Yasoda's love. And actually, our Acharyas, they give an example. They give an example of this sweetness, of this kind of love. The, uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur gives a simple example. That, so just like a bee, when a bee enters into a lotus flower, 
There's a lot of nectar in that lotus flower. And when a bee enters in the lotus flower, the lotus flower closes at night and the bee's trapped. But although the bee is trapped in that lotus flower, the bee doesn't care of being, being trapped. There's so much nectar in that flower. <laughs> it doesn't mind at all that he's trapped. And he gives us an example that Krishna, Krishna is so much attracted by parental love, friendship love, conjugal love. He's so much attractive by these relationships, he forgets he's God. He forgets he's God. He's so bound by their love, he becomes covered and be forgets that he's God because that's how he can very deeply enter into the relationship with the devotees who love him in that mood. So someone said, Someone may say, how can God forget his God? He's all-knowing. And uh, this, of course, is addressed by our Acharyas also, Vishwana Chakravati Thakur, that Krishna is so inconceivable. He's so inconceivable. We can't, sometimes we try to encapsulate God into our conception of who is God. You know, what he can do, what he can't do. But, you know. One of his qualities, one of his characteristics is achintya sakti. Achintya means you can't approach a full understanding about his pastimes and his, his qualities, his personality, simply by the mind. They can only be understood when they're revealed. Only be understood by those who actually love him. Lord Brahma says, Primanjana Charita Bhakti Valochanina Santaksadava Hridayeshi Valokyanti. He says when, when the eyes, one's eyes are, are anointed with the salve of love, then one can actually understand Krishna and see Krishna. Krishna even tells Arjuna in the battlefield of Kurukshetra, only by undivided devotional service can you know me as I am, and only then can you enter into the mysteries of understanding me. The inconceivable qualities of Krishna cannot be simply understood by the mind. We can travel the speed of the mind for millions of years and never fully be able to understand Krishna. Krishna can be simultaneously, simultaneously all-knowing and bewildered. In Dwarka, he's more Aishvaya, more knowing. And sometimes he's bewildered. Like when he said to, to Uddhava, there's a very wonderful story when Krishna was with Uddhava and Krishna was bewildered. He had to make a decision to where he would go when he received the request to, to fulfill the, the request of the kings. And at the same time, he was being invited to the Rajasuya sacrifice. He was saying, what should I do? So Krishna said, can you please, can you tell me what I should do? And Uddhava said, this is very bewildering to me. <laughs> Why are you asking me? <laughs> Why are you asking me? But you're God. Uddhava knows Krishna's divinity. You're God. Why are you asking me what to do? <laughs> he was very bewildered by it. Krishna's request. So sometimes there's a little bewilderment there. But in Braj, Krishna's mostly covered, bewildered. And sometimes he manifests his Aishvaya, his opulence, in a, in a way that uh, not really disturbs, it doesn't disturb the relationship the devotees have towards him. I'll give you an example. When Krishna was returning from the pasturing grounds, the demigods were in the sky and they were showering flowers on Krishna. And Mother Jasoda was looking, saying, what a wonderful son I have. <laughs> Just see, the demigods are showering flowers. Her love was not in any way disturbed by the fact that demigods were showering flowers. Because her love is fixed. 
fixed, not disturbed in any way. I'll give you an, another example. Everybody ever hear about when Krishna devoured a forest fire? When Krishna devoured a forest fire, why did he devour the forest fire? Because the, cow, the calves wandered off into the forest, the cowherd boys went to look for them, and all of a sudden the calves were surrounded by the fire, and the cowherd boys had gone to look for them, and then the cowherd boys were also in a very difficult situation, and Krishna started looking for them, and Krishna saw the forest fire, and he told the cowherd boys, close your eyes. So they close their eyes. And what did Krishna do? Very wonderful thing, Aishvaya. He swallowed the fire. And somebody said, well, why did he tell the cowherd boys to close their eyes? And the cowherd boys, when they found out that Krishna, that the fire was gone, they were thinking that, well, he must know some kind of a mantra that nobody else knows. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why he asked us to close our, his eye, close our eyes. And then, then also it is explained that <clears throat> Krishna asked them to close their eyes because one time my friends told my mother that I ate dirt. <laughs> and my mother was very angry with me. And I was, I was, I had to deal with that. What is she going to do if they tell her I ate fire? <laughs> what? So Krishna was, said, close your eyes. <laughs> close your eyes. So there's a certain sweetness there. It's a sweetness that makes Krishna's pastimes sweet. There's a certain sweetness when Krishna descends in this world. Right? There's a certain sweet. Even the residents of Goloka, even the residents of Goloka, they don't get to experience Krishna's birth. So when Krishna comes, he comes in this, to give them the special taste of his appearance. Because in the spiritual world, nobody, nobody takes birth. No, DeSoto doesn't take birth, not the cowherd boys don't take birth. They're, they're eternal, eternal associates of the Lord. Nobody takes birth in the spiritual world. But experience the sweetness, Krishna comes and he descends. He is avatari and avatara, both. He is the source of all avatars, is avatari. Ete chang sakala pung sa krishna's tu bhagavan svayam. But he manifests, uh, or as he says, a jopi san aviyatma, bhuta nami shuropi san. He said, although I'm unborn, my transcendental body never deteriorates, although I'm the lord of all sentient beings, still I appear in every millennium in my original transcendental form. He comes by his own sweet will. Why? to give pleasure to his devotees. He doesn't have to come to kill demons. Demons are killed, but Krishna comes, he can arrange for killing demons. He says, Parashanaya sadunam finashi achaduskritam. I come to deliver the devotees and annihilate the miscreants. But he doesn't have to, he, Krishna can snap his fingers and take care of demons. But the devotees are so eager to see him, he comes. So eager to see him. Right? There's many devotees in this, in, every, in this universe, in every universe. Why, in this universe, in any universe, why are the devotees so eager to see him? Because Krishna goes from one universe to the next to the next to give the opportunity for perfected souls who want to go to the spiritual world. They can't take their birth there. They take their birth where Krishna's pastimes are manifest in the material world. They are the associate with Krishna's eternal associates and they become qualified to enter into the spiritual world. This is all explained in Brihad Bhagavatam Rita. I'm giving a summary. It's, it's a wonderful book, isn't it? I'm just giving you a little, little 
taste of what's, what Pradikshit Maharaj told his mother. As she was very, very eager to hear, can you give me the essence of, of what you heard from Shukadeva Goswami? And this is, uh, uh, this is just a little, sorry, I have to check my watch. What's the schedule? To 1.15. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I actually have a schedule this afternoon too because I have another program. I'm sorry, I lost myself. I haven't even gotten to the verse in Brihad Bhagavatam right <laughs> I, I have a ha very bad habit and sometimes I have to ask my assistants. When I'm introducing something, I tend to speak. My introduction is <laughs> longer than... and. Uh, so I was actually introducing this verse from Brihad Bhagavatamrita. So, and I didn't get to it yet. So let me read the verse, because I think that if I read the verse, the verse speaks about Krishna's attractive pastimes. And, uh, and the commentary by Srila Sanatana Goswami himself also explains a little bit something about uh, this topic. And, uh, since we're going for a little bit longer, maybe I can also leave time if anybody have any, has any questions. I, I'll leave a few minutes for that also. So let me read the verse. And uh, this is the second part of the Brihad Bhagavatam Gita. Fourth chapter, verse 187. I won't read the Sanskrit. I'll just read the English translation. And Krishna is different from Narayan, for when Krishna appears in his descent in the material world, he fully manifests the many unique glories that distinguish Krishna alone. Charming, attractive glories. Charming, attractive glories that can be known only to hearts softened by Prema Bhakti. Just like it, it's actually explained by one of our Acharyas, Rupa Goswami, that there are four unique characteristics of Krishna which are not manifest anywhere else. There's Rupa Madhurya, the sweetness of his form, Lila Madhurya, the sweetness of his pastimes, Venu Madhurya, which is the sound, the sweet sound of his flute. Krishna doesn't play flute in Dwarka. In fact, there's a whole section in Brihad Bhagavatam Rita when Gopa Kumara comes as a young cowherd boy and he's carrying a flute as a cowherd boy and Krishna's sitting on a throne in Dwarka and then he sees Gopa Kumara with the flute and Krishna reaches over you know, to examine what is this and he starts looking at the flute and Uddhava is looking at him and Uddhava sees that Krishna's starting to lose control of himself while he was holding the flute. And Uddhava had to immediately had to bring Krishna back to external consciousness so he didn't go too far because present were many other very important regal in Dwarka. He's surrounded by many other important personalities. Ugasena is there and uh, others. So uh, when Krishna took the flute in his hands and started looking at it, he was Something about that flute was very attractive. <laughs> so, but in Dwarka there's no flute playing. There's no pasturing grounds. There's no cows pasturing the pasturing grounds. This is a special place where these pastimes are going on. And uh, Anyways, well, I say Rupa Madhurya, Lila Madhurya, Venu Madhurya, and Prema Priyadika. Prema Priyadika means that he's surrounded by these devotees. Always surrounded by devotees. These are four special qualities or characteristics of Krishna which are not manifest in any other form. So uh, that's what it says here. That in the material world, he fully manifests the many unique glories that distinguish Krishna alone, charming, attractive glories that could be known only to hearts softened by Prema Bhakti. Purport. 
Someone may raise the doubt that since Narayan, the lord of Vaikuntha, is also described in Vedic scriptures as the avatari, or source of all incarnations, how can Sri Krishna be greater than Narayan? Narayan's avatari, he's all incarnations that descend in this world, they actually come from Lord Narayan. But of course, what's going to be explained here is, although Narayan is avatari, he doesn't descend. He's always in the spiritual world. But Krishna is the source of all forms of the Lord, and he's avatari, but he's also avatara which makes him greater. <clears throat> Narada replies in this verse, Krishna is the all-victorious supreme personality of Godhead greater than everyone, including the Lord of Vaikuntha. When Krishna descends to the material world, he reveals especially sweet qualities that attract the hearts of everyone. What kinds of qualities distinguish Sri Krishna as greater than all avatars? even the avatari, Narayan. To understand this topic properly, one needs a heart softened by pure love for Krishna. Just like some think that Narayan is, must be God because he has four arms, and Krishna only has two arms, so he must, Narayan must be greater than Krishna. <laughs> and actually this is also explained in Chaitanya Charitamrita, this under, misunderstanding that, yes, the higher understanding is Krishna's two-armed form. Benam kvanantam aravinda dalaya taksham. Krishna who plays the flute, holding his threefold, playing in a threefold bending form. That is, that is the original source, which all happens by, simply by his will. By his will. He doesn't have to, doesn't have to uh, plan it. He doesn't have to get involved in creation. He doesn't have to get involved in anything else. It all happens perfectly by his multifarious energies that work according to his desires. There's a lot, of, there's a lot that can be explained about his desires. But uh, <clears throat> to understand this topic properly, one needs a heart softened by pure love for Krishna. But even without the requirement, one can consider that most forms of Godhead like the Narayan of Bhadarikasham, are only avatars, whereas the Supreme Controller, Sri Narayan, the Lord of Vaikuntha, is not an avatar, but the avatari. Krishna, however, is both avatari and avatara. Thus, Krishna displays his role as avatara, this displays in his role as the avatar the sweetness of his various varied pastimes in his role as the avatari, the supreme status of the absolute controller. Therefore, Krishna is the greatest form of God. There's a little more. I'm going to tell one little story. Because we're going to do Tamadarastaka? Yes? Okay, I, want to I want to tell a little story related to the Dhammadarlila, if that's okay. Yes? I got a thumbs up. Okay. <clears throat> now, in Dhammadalila, as we know, Mother Jasoda, she was attempting to tie up her naughty child, stole the butter, distributed it to the monkeys, created a mess, and uh, she wanted to punish him uh, by uh, tying him up. I won't go into the whole Leela because if I do, I'll, I'll end too late. But I just want to just get into a, a very relevant point about this particular pastime. And that is that, as we know, the Aishvaya of that Leela, Aishvaya means Vibhuti Shakti. It's, 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 an, it's an opulence of Krishna that's really amazing. What is that? The Bhuti Shakti feature, the Aishvaya feature, is that Mother Jasoda wanted to tie up her son to punish him. And she took the rope, we all know, and she tried to tie it. 
And when she tied it, it was two fingers too short. And she worked very hard. She wanted to, she was thinking, I have to punish my son. He's, that's the motherly affection she had. She even asked all the other cowherd women, can you please go get ropes? And all the cowherd women were telling Yasoda, Yasoda, can't you see? You're not going to be able to tie up your son. You've tried and tried and tried. And it's, it's like, why are you asking us to get more rope? And, and Yasoda's response was, I want to see the extent of my son's waist. <laughs> Bring the ropes. <laughs> so of course, they all went to the houses and they collected their ropes. And she brought them and Yasoda was adding one rope to the next and one rope to the next. And every time, still, two fingers too short. And this is described, that this is one of the characteristics of Krishna, is that the Vibhuti Shakti, it's, it's a, a great powerful feature of the Lord that's amazing. How is it possible that here's his mother adding so many lengths of rope to another length, which is two fingers too short. And then when she adds the next rope, it's still two fingers too short. And when she asks them. So this is the Vibhuti Shakti. So there's another potency of Krishna that manifests during this pastime. It's called his Satya Sankalpa Shakti. Satya Sankalpa Shakti is the potency of Krishna that fulfills whatever he desires he has. Krishna wanted to play. He wanted to play with his friends. He didn't want to be tied up. <clears throat> so the Satya Sankalpa Shakti also manifests, and that's why Yasoda couldn't tie him up, because he wanted to play and he didn't want to be tied up. So here you have the Vibhuti Shakti present, the Satya Sankalpa Shakti present, both potencies of the Lord. But you have a devotee who's Yasoda. And Jasoda, she was so determined to tie up her son that when Krishna was looking at her efforts, perspiration was falling from her face. She was, you know, the flowers were slackening from her hair. She was working hard. And when Krishna saw the labor, which the word is actually parishrama, he saw the labor of his mother. What happened is the Kripa Shakti manifested in his heart. What is the Kripa Shakti? It's mercy. His heart melted. His heart completely melted, so much so that despite the fact that he wanted to play, sometimes that exists between the competition between the devotee and the Lord, the devotee's will prevails and defeats Krishna. Why was Krishna defeated? He was defeated by the love of his mother. That's what defeated the love. Her maternal affection was so powerful, so strong, convincing, that when Krishna saw how much she was laboring to tie him up, then the third Shakti that manifested in this pastime was his mercy. His heart melted completely melted. And when his heart melted, then what happened was the Satya Sankalpi, Satya Sankalpa Shakti, and the Vibhuti Shakti, they just said, let's go. <laughs> they both left. They were both defeated. How were they defeated? They were defeated by characteristic of Krishna's devotee, which is called Bhakta Nishta. Bhakta Nishta means conviction. Mother Jasoda's nishta, her conviction is that I will tie up my son, he needs to be punished. And Krishna is called Svanishta. What is that Svanishta? That Svanishta is his own conviction that I'm controlled by the love of my devotee. I'm always controlled by the love of my devotee. My devotee's love 
Na sadi yatu mam yogo ne shankya dhamma udhava. Krishna tells her udhava. The unalloyed devotional service rendered to me by my devotee brings me under his control. I can't be conquered by austerities. I can't be conquered by sacrifices. These won't conquer me. I'm conquered by love. That's what defeats me. So Krishna displayed in this pastime of Dhammadar Lila how he's conquered by the love of his mother. She conquered him by her unalloyed love, so much so that Krishna was bound by her love. And therefore the distance of two fingers was diminished, completely gone, by Svanishta. What is that Svanishta? Krishna's conviction that I will always accept the pure unalloyed love of my devotee and become subordinate to that love. Just like Krishna told Arjuna, Kantiya Patajani Hika, Nami Bhakti Pranasi. He said, Arjuna, you declare it boldly that my devotee is never vanquished. Why did he tell Arjuna to declare it? He said, because sometimes I may say something, but I may not do it. I may break my own promise, like he did when he picked up the chariot wheel to attack Bhishma. He said, but when my devotee says it, I always uphold what my devotee says. And if you say it, everyone will have to accept it. So he says, you say it, you declare it, Arjuna. My devotee is never vanquished. That is the power of bhakti. And as, as, uh, as uh, Sanatana Goswami says, these charming, attractive glories can be known only to hearts softened by bhakti, prema bhakti, love, love. They can understand and enter into the mystery of understanding these pastimes. That's just a little bit. I, there's more I could talk about Dhamma Dalila, but I wanted to bring that up because it was related to the, what we were talking about. Another sweet quality or characteristic of Krishna's subordination to, to the love of his devotees. He's loved, he's subordinate to all his devotees in, in Braj. You know, you know, the cowherd boys can jump on his back. I mean, can imagine jumping on Krishna's back. I mean, who, who would jump on Krishna's back if you thought he was God? No way, I can't do it. So they forget. They forget his divinity. These are attractive pastimes of Krishna. This is what makes Krishna so attractive. And the more we hear about him, then the more we become attracted to him. So uh, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Does anybody have a question? You were talking about how when Krishna is speaking in Varka, he's not able to pick up the food. But I will bring the description of speech is ready to be the reason why Krishna didn't do it, because in Dwarka, everybody's, he's Krishna's reciprocating with everyone according to their mood. And Uddhava knows that. Because Uddhava, Uddhava knows about Braj. He's been to Braj. He's seen the gopis. He's seen Nanda Maharaj and Jasoda. He knows the nature of Braj. He knows Krishna's pastimes in Braj, although he's a resident of Dwarka. But he's a very confidential servant of Krishna. So he knew that Krishna, if he becomes too much absorbed, it will disturb the mood of everybody else in Dwarka. Because their mood is seeing Krishna as prince, and, and uh, not playing a flute, but actually uh, taking the position of a prince who is, has, he has his queens, and he, he has his children, and the rain, he's not, not that flute sound. <laughs> You won't hear Krishna playing a flute in Dwarka. <laughs> he's calling everybody in Braj, when he plays that flute, everybody's so much captivated by the sound. The cows, their, their ears immediately go up and they, they become like cups. And the gopis, they hear it as Krishna's calling us. and He's calling his cows and everybody comes when Krishna plays his flute. But in Dwarka, he couldn't do that because everybody else has a different mood. And that's what Brihad Bhagavatamrita actually describes, is every mood is perfect 
every place, excuse me, every abode and place is perfect according to the mood that one wants to serve Krishna. It's just so perfect. And the whole essence of, of Bihad, Bhag Bihad Bhagavad Samrita is Gopal Kumar, he had a particular attraction for Krishna as Madan Gopal. He wanted Krishna as his friend. And he was looking for a certain intimacy in that relationship, a certain that he couldn't find anywhere else. And wherever he went, whether he was in Dwarka, whether he was in Yodhya, he was in Vaikuntha, there was something still missing in his heart. In everybody else, they were fully satisfied. So in Dwarka, everyone was there, and therefore Uddhava said, no, 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 be careful. <laughs> because everybody else who's present, they won't, they won't understand. And uh, there are many descriptions, it's a very dis many descriptions given in Brihad Bhagavatamrita of residents speaking out, objecting to things Gopakumar did because it disturbed their mood. When, when Gopakumar was in Vaikuntha, he saw, he saw Krishna sitting on a throne and he, he began running to him and he said, Gopal! You like that, right? Gopal! <laughs> and he began running and he began speaking in that mood and the residents of Vaikuntha say, what, what are you doing here? That is, nobody praises our, our Lord of Vaikuntha in that way. He's not Gopal. <laughs> and they started talking in different ways. And we talk, talk, when you talk about Vaik Lord of Vaikuntha, you should be talking, Narayan, you should be talking about Krishna who descends to the material world to deliver the pious, annihilate the miscreants. You should glorify him this way. He's not a cowherd boy. This is, you know, this, they, 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 were, they were disturbed. So you may say, well, don't they love Krishna? Yeah, they do love Krishna, but they have a mood. They have a mood. And that mood, does, Krishna doesn't want them to have that mood disturbed. And sometimes he, certain elements happen, like when Gopal Kumar came with the flute, and Uddhava understood, and he said, be careful, be careful. Look, look who's around, they won't understand. And he brought him back to external consciousness. Anyways, yes? Um, I have a question that um, when we talk about the glories of the Rajabhasis, as um, one of the glories is that they don't uh, say Krishna in Aishwarya form. They, always they don't? In his Aishwarya form, like they only have that um, personal love. They don't know his Aishwarya form and his opulence. Um, but um, in many of the pastimes, for example, when Krishna is eating dirt, um, and Mother Yashoda is sort of recogni uh, recognizing when she sees the Brahman in his mouth. And then Krishna gets Yogmaya to, you know, cover Yashoda Maya, uh, Mata's uh, consciousness. So it's more about uh, the Yogmaya coming in and stepping in so that the Vrajvasis don't see his opulence, right? It's more about Krishna's will and Yogmaya doing his bidding um, rather than the Vrajvasis themselves being totally in that. Oh. Sometimes these will come up. They'll surface. They will see many examples like Mother Jasoda, even the cowherd men. It's, the, it's their ecstasy. Example is given, is an example given if you take boiling milk and you put a blade of grass in the boiling milk, that boiling milk is, you know, is boiling and sometimes the, the blade of grass will come up to the surface. But because the milk is still boiling, it'll, it's, it goes down again. So sometimes these Aishvaya, you know, these thoughts will come, but just as quickly as they come, they go. <laughs> and why? Because of yoga maya. And it, that's part of the ecstasy of their love. Sometimes even the cowherd men, they think this way, they, it, 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 about Krishna, and, but they immediately forget. They completely forget afterwards. They, because that's the nature of, of Raj. So you may say, is, is, that, is that artificial? No, I say it's not artificial. It's the nature of ecstasy. As ecstasy is filled with unlimited varieties of experiences. They experience that also, but it never disturbs their primary, primary relationship with Krishna. 
never disturbs it. That's the, that's why it's 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 their f- stai bhava. Stai bhava means it's their fixed bhava. That's the yeah, stai bhava is a friendship. Uh, they may get some ecstasy, and, but it won't be disturbed. And that, of course, enhances their love. Yes. How does he know if he has that kind of love? Is that it? What's the symptoms of that kind of love? That kind of love is uh, greed. It's usually manifest in the form of greed. That we be, when we become greedy for that kind of experience. And the symptom of greed is that you're ready to undergo any inconvenience to obtain it. Then you know your heart's becoming softer. It's coming softer. It takes a while for that greed to awaken. But it's natural, it's there, because every living entity by nature has desire. And if we don't nourish a desire for Krishna, then our desire will be nourished for something else. Therefore, in the Bhagavatam, it's described, Bhakti Pareshana Bhava Varakti Anyaita Chaisha Chika Eka Kala. The symptom that our heart is becoming softer. The verse says, devotion, Direct experience of Krishna and detachment from material things. These three things manifest simultaneously for a person whose actually heart is becoming softer, engaged in devotion. Just like pleasure, nourishment, and l- relief from hunger come simultaneously and increasingly with each bite for a person who's eating. When a person's eating, he doesn't have to ask somebody else, does this taste good? When a person's eating, he doesn't say, is my hunger going away? He knows. He knows. He's getting nourishment. He's getting strength. He's experiencing pleasure. And he sees that his, his hunger is going away. In the same way a devotee who's advancing, he sees he's losing his attachment for material things. He sees his devotion is increasing. Just like a person who's eating knows. You don't ask somebody, you know. That's how you know. And how does it start? Greed. Desire. Let me have more. I want more. This is nice. I want more. Krishna sees that desire. And he's in your heart. When he sees that desire, he says, Te shamivana kampartama hamagyana jamtama. I'll destroy with the shining lamp of the host of darkness of one of the universe. To those who are always endeavoring, I'll give them the understanding by which they'll come to me. He'll bring them closer. Desire. That's all it is. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Once you start, Maharaj, you can um, offer here and then do the kirtan. Meanwhile, other guests can also can offer flowers. Okay, offer flowers. Is that what it is? Okay. We have tea light and flowers. Aha. Ah. It's okay. We can compensate. Yes.
Do they have the words or they know everyone? Do you want me to chant Damodarastaka? Amara, do you like you to sing uh, Damodarashkam? Yes, but does anybody know the words? Uh, many of us have phones. We will probably send them in a message. Okay. The, you can open any song and
what is next? Thank you so much, Thank you.